Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Pediatric Grand Rounds today. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Travis Reeves from the, from the Department of Otolaryngology. He is a graduate of the Duke University School of Medicine and completed his training at University of South Carolina with fellowship training at the University of Minnesota. He's been with the Carillion family for just a little bit over a year and lends his time as an expert uh, panel member of Delta Dental and of the Cleft Palate Multidisciplinary Team. Please welcome Dr. Travis Reed. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you guys for having me. Um, I really appreciate uh, the invite to come and talk, um, particularly about one of my favorite topics. Um, it's been great over the last year to get to know um, all of uh, the people that are involved in pediatrics here. Um, it's been really exciting to see the commitment uh, to caring for children here. Um, it's exciting to be a part of it. Um, if you guys have questions um, as we're going through this, please don't hesitate to stop to ask. Um, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I'm also um, available um, on, you know, by my cell phone, if you guys need my cell phone number. Um, if you're in clinic and you see something weird or strange, you have a question, um, you can text me a picture, you can call me. Um, I want to be a resource for you guys, so I want to be available. So um, if uh, you need uh, my contact information, please don't hesitate to, um, uh, to stop me um, and ask me before I leave. So today we're going to talk about uh, pediatric airway disorders, um, and as I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about how do, we, how do we want to do this? I don't want to just give you guys a list of airway problems and talk to you about the ways that we treat them surgically, because that's not really relevant um, to what you're seeing on a daily basis. And so as I was thinking about this, I really wanted to share with you guys <clears throat> how I think about the problem and the framework for diagnosis and management of the child who has noisy breathing. So this really isn't just, um, uh, isn't just airway disorders, it isn't just Strider, it's really sort of all noisy breathing that essentially can be coming into your office. No, no. Okay, perfect. All right, I have no disclosures. Um, so obviously I think about breathing a lot. Um, this is you know, probably 25 to 30 percent of what I see in my clinic um, are kids who have some kind of breathing issue. Um, on the inpatient side, that percentage is significantly higher. Um, probably 50 to 75 percent of the consults that we get are related to airway uh, somehow um, or another. And so what I really wanted to do is talk to you guys about how it is that I think about it. Um, what am I thinking about? How do I think about it? What is the framework? How do we narrow the diagnosis? And how does that determine what we do as far as treatment? So the objectives of the talk is to provide a framework for diagnosis of pediatric airway disorders. We're going to use age, physical exam, and risk factors to narrow the really broad differential um, in a systematic fashion. And then we're going to review using a couple of case examples. So obviously we're going to start with um, airway anatomy. And I think about this really very simplistically. So, you know, each subside of the airway has a million different things that you can think about. So when we're talking about um, the glottis or the voice box, I mean, even the vocal cords themselves have, you know, like 50 different little subsites and layers of, you know, mucosa and how the vocal wave works and all of that. And we're not going to go into that. What we really want to think about when we're talking about airway, uh, pediatric airway disorders is we want to divide it into three different sections. So we want to talk about First, the upper airway. So very simply, that's everything that's above the vocal cords, okay? So that's everything from the very front of the nose all the way down to about here, and this is where the vocal cords are going to be. The second area that we're going to talk about is the glottic airway. The glottic airway is uh, the vocal cords themselves and the subglottis. And the subglottis is the area of the very proximal trachea that's surrounded by the cricoid ring, okay? And so that... That's a very small, very short area, but very, very important area of um, the airway. And then the lower airway is everything that's below the cricoid ring. So um, it's the, um, the proximal and distal trachea, the main stem bronchi, um, and then also um, all the way down to the distal bronchioles. So when we're talking about the noisy breather, um, what we're talking about is we're talking about airway turbulence. Um, turbulence results in uh, the noise that we hear on a uh, physical exam. And so turbulence is characterized by chaotic changes in pressure and flow velocity. So it is in contrast to what we call laminar flow, 
which occurs when fluid flows in parallel layers with absolutely no disruption. So that's the way that it should be. When we're breathing normally, you should just have simple lamp. <laughs> Um, airway noise is most easily described as a result of non-laminar turbulent flow through a tube. So anything that's causing turbulence is going to cause noisy breathing. And so one of the ways to think about this from a, a physics or math perspective is the Reynolds number. It's a dimensionless uh, quantity that uh, is used in fluid mechanics to help predict flow patterns in different fluid flow situations. So, you know, there's a lot of different stuff that's going on here. We're talking about velocity of fluid, the characteristic links. Uh, or the cord of, uh, width of an airfoil, the density of the fluid, and the viscosity. The point of this is, is that velocity is very intimately, the velocity of the fluid, the airfoil, <coughs> um, is very intimately associated with turbulence um, or with noisy breathing, as well as the uh, density of the fluid. Now, the density of the fluid that we're breathing is generally always going to be the same, but if you think about something like heliox, we're lowering the density, and so that's going to take what is non-laminar flow and can actually turn it into laminar flow, okay? So these are the things that we're going to, going to be talking about. So first and foremost, we need to learn to identify and describe the patient's airway noise as it relates to the phase of breathing, okay? So inspiratory noise, so this is probably the most important part. Inspiratory noise suggests an upper airway <coughs> problem related to all of the structures above the vocal cords. So that's the front of the nose all the way um, to the structures above the vocal cords. Biphasic strider indicates a glottic or subglottic narrowing. So if you're hearing biphasic strider, you can really narrow down your differential because it's a really small part of the, of the airway. And then expiratory strider likely has a tracheal or a bronchial component. And then what you guys deal with much more than I do is wheezing. So wheezing is sort of a form of that. It's just the very, very most distal part of that, okay? So, um, we're going to create our differential diagnosis based on the phase of breathing as well as the patient's age, um, and we're going to start our discussion of airway problems and classify these by age. So we're going to start at the very beginning, um, and we're going to look at the neonatal airway, and so we're going to start with neonates, and then we're going to divide the airway problems into the different phases of breathing that we'll see. So we're talking first about neonatal inspiratory noise, and I use the word noise because um, it technically is strider, probably, um, but we don't classify a kid who's just snorty or boogery or mucousy as strider. Um, and so a lot of the upper airway has that characteristic, so I call it inspiratory noise um, more than uh, strider because we really divide it into stertor and strider. So stertor is the rough upper airway sound um, that you associate with congestion or mucus related. It's kind of like a snoring type sound when the kid's awake. Um, this is typically associated with nasal obstruction, nasal congestion, base of tongue obstruction, things like that. Strider is uh, variable, particularly in the upper airway, uh, but typically strider has a regular and repeating quality to the sound. The supraglottic larynx uh, is probably gonna be the most common cause of true inspiratory strider. So we're going to start at inspiratory noise in the neonates at the very front of the airway, which is going to be the nose, okay? So when you see a child who has inspiratory noise, it's snorty, it sounds like nasal obstruction, you're going to primarily think of four different things in children who, are, who have just been born. The first is rhinitis of infancy. So this would be kind of the characteristic appearance that you'll see on the anterior rhinoscopy. Um, it looks like a kid who has the worst allergies you've ever seen. It's a swollen inferior turbinate, it's boggy, it's pale, um, and it completely obstructs the entire uh, nasal airway. Children who have rhinitis of infancy can be very, very ill appearing, even though their exam is otherwise benign. Um, the next is nasal lacrimal duct cyst. So this is caused by uh, incomplete canalization of uh, the nasal lacrimal duct. And so essentially what happens is, is you get buildup of fluid coming from the lacrimal sac as it comes down. So if this is the eye up here and then it comes down, right here, underneath the inferior turbinate, there's a little valve right here called Hausner's valve. That's what allows the tears to come in the nose, which is why when you're crying, you have tears, you have, you know, a runny nose, right? So um, what happens is, is if there's a membrane there instead of an opening, then you get this dilation of that membrane and you get this kind of cyst that forms. It's really probably um, more of a pseudocyst because it's not completely, um, not completely, uh, uh, separate. It's actually connected to the nasal lacrimal duct itself. Um, kids can have, again, really profound nasal obstruction as a result of this. 
The next is going to be piriform aperture stenosis. This is bony overgrowth at the very front of the nose. So it's literally the bone that you can feel when you touch the sides of uh, your alar crease. And the classic appearance on CT scan is what we call the punching fist. And so it's this little area here. <coughs> And so the bony overgrowth there basically pinches the front of the nose shut. The, the hallmark to this is that when you try to look in the nose, you can't. Like you can't even, you don't even see anything. You try to put the speculum in or you try to, in my case, put the scope in and you just hit a bony dead end. Um, and that's really classic for piriform aperture stenosis. This is pretty easy to fix. You can just sort of chip away this bone. Um, and the kids are better. And I say better because it's been shown that even though kids have bony overgrowth at the front of the nose, they actually don't have a normal nose in general. Their nose is far more narrow all the way back than a normal nose. Um, and so you do this and you make them better, but they're not going to be 100% normal. And then the last is the one that is probably the most familiar with is coenal atresia. Children who have bilateral coenal atresia are going to be very, very ill right after birth. Obviously, infant neonates are obligate nasal breathers. And so if you have bilateral obstruction, they're going to be super sick appearing. Um, if you have unilateral coenal atresia, a lot of times that's actually not detected until much later on in life. I will often see kids in my office, and I see them for some other reason. I just recently saw a 10-year-old, and the parents were like, oh, hey, we just, as I'm like walking out the door, they were like, by the way, we've always wondered why my kid has pus coming out of one side of their nose and not the other. And I was like, let's take a look. Um, and sure enough, she had unilateral coenal atresia and otherwise was totally asymptomatic um, as a 10-year-old. Um, so typically with uh, nasal obstruction, you're going to see um, severe nasal obstruction, very snorty, and these kids look terrible. They're, in, they're really in distress. They can have cyanotic episodes, um, and they have a very snorty sound, does not improve with the positioning, and they have severe feeding problems as a result of that. Um, Rhinitis of infancy is treated with topical medications or just time, depending on how the kids are doing. Everything else can be treated surgically. So moving down the airway, we're now going to go to the oropharynx. The oropharynx is the back of the throat. Um, it's uh, the back of the mouth, so it includes uh, the soft palate, the base of the tongue, and the pharyngeal walls. Now, if I don't say anything else, if you don't remember anything else, just remember that a cleft palate does not cause noisy breathing, okay? So I can't tell you the number of times that I will see a, um, a kid who has airway obstruction for another reason, but they also just happen to have a cleft palate, and um, they were, you know, they were seen in the, uh, in the nursery, and they just said, oh, the noisy breathing is because of the cleft palate, and so they were sent home, but they actually had something else really significant going on. So the cleft palate is never the cause. I mean, if you think about it, the airway is actually probably better, right? I mean, it's a bigger hole, so um, it does not cause noisy breathing. So the most common site of obstruction in the oropharynx is going to be the base of tongue obstruction. Um, base of tongue obstruction is, and, uh, is generally caused by micronathia. So if you think about it, you have a small jaw. There's not enough room for the tongue uh, to sit in the mouth, so it tends to sit high and it tends to sit posteriorly. And if it's, the micronathia is severe enough and it sits high enough and posteriorly enough, then you can get a cleft palate. So that's Pierre Rubin's sequence. So it's not, it's not Pierre Rubin syndrome, it's Pierre Rubin's sequence. Pierre Rubin's sequence can be part of other syndromes, um, but um, in and of itself, it's just a series of events that happens where the palate physically can't form because the tongue is sitting in the way. And so um, this is probably the most common site, and this is the, one of the things that I'm most interested in. And uh, my fellowship director, um, so I'm craniofacially trained as well as uh, pediatric ENT. So um, in the program that I trained at, we did um, all of the craniofacial surgery, so cleft um, and distraction and all of that. And so um, the guy who taught me was one of the pioneers in micronathia and mandibular distraction, and so I really enjoy taking care of these uh, patients who have micronathia. So the interesting thing about base of tongue obstruction is that it's often re unrecognized for prolonged periods of time. It actually can be a really subtle presentation sometimes. Patients typically do not have cyanosis or severe <coughs> saturation events. Obstruction is often uh, a simple stertorous sound or they don't have any sound at all, actually. Um, the typical presentation is uh, what my fellowship director called the old man worried look. These kids just don't look comfortable. They look, uh, 
um, like they're miserable all the time. And what's really interesting is after you do distraction on a kid who really has significant airway obstruction, um, that old man worried look goes away. So I remember the first time that he like told me that, like, oh, this kid is really miserable. He has the old man worried look. And I was like, and he was a little bit nutty. And I was like, this, I have no idea what he's talking about. And then we distracted the kid. And two weeks later, the kid's totally normal, feeding normally, breathing normally. And that look completely went away. So it really is real. Um, so these kids uh, have feeding problems. Feeding problems are probably the best proxy for airway. So if you think a kid might have an airway problem, but maybe it's not super severe, really focus in on their feeding. So I ask questions about, um, you know, how many bottles does the kid take a day? How long does it take them to take a bottle? How much does it take? If it's taking them an hour to take a two ounce bottle, that obviously is more concerning than if they're chugging six ounces in five minutes, you know, then I'm much less concerned about the airway. Uh, mild desaturation events, uh, that resolve with simple stimulation and repositioning is common with base of tongue obstruction. And my favorite way to really diagnose this is simple auscultation. I basically never touch a stethoscope except when I'm seeing a base of tongue obstruction patient. And what I do is I put the stethoscope on the patient and you listen for several minutes at a time. And what you'll notice is the kid will have several normal breaths and then you'll see them and it looks like they're continuing to breathe but you hear no air movement at all. And so what happens is, is um, they're completely obstructed during that, and then they start breathing normally again. And so essentially what they're having is sleep apnea while they're awake. It's just that it's really hard to recognize in the neonatal population. The venous blood gas will show an elevated PCO2 in really bad cases, um, but most of the time um, you don't see that unless it's pretty significant. We do use polysomnography or a pneumogram sometimes in these kids. Um, the Reliability of a sleep study in kids this age is not as good as it is in older kids, but we'll use this sometimes if we're thinking about non-surgical management, and we just want to make sure there's nothing bad, nothing scary happening while the child is sleeping. We will use this if we're thinking about sitting at home without doing surgery. The treatment for this is primarily and initially a nasal trumpet placement. The nasal trumpet is not for the child to breathe through, okay? The nasal trumpet is sitting in the back of the tongue and is pushing the tongue forward, and they're breathing around the the nasal trumpet, okay? So they're getting just a little bit of soft tissue advancement forward and they're actually breathing around that. So the nasal trumpet has to be placed in just the right place. If it's placed too far down, then the kids have feeding problems and they have reflux because you've got it in the esophagus, or if it's too high, it's not doing anything. And because the larynx sits very high in children, you've only got literally about like a centimeter that it needs to be placed. So generally we're the ones who place it, mark it, put it where it needs to be, and then we show the nurses exactly how to do it. Um, and as long as you have it marked, then it's easy because they do tend to come out. Uh, come out. And you can actually send kids home for weeks with that while they, um, while they grow and get bigger um, if you're not planning to do surgery. Mandibular distraction is probably the standard of care for this problem. Uh, mandibular distraction is great. It works very well for this. Um, and generally within the distraction phase, which is about seven to 10 days after surgery, um, the children will go from the old man worried look, not being able to breathe, not being able to lay on their back, not being able to feed, to be able to do all of those things <coughs> while they have the distractors on. So usually that's within a few days. Tongue lip adhesion is medieval and should never be done in my opinion. Um, I have seen it once and it, I mean, it's just, it's nuts. I don't really know what else to say about it. It just really doesn't ever need to be done again. Trach and peg is often used um, for uh, kids who have severe micronathia. Mandibular distraction is still the number one option unless the kid has severe comorbid conditions. In that case, trach and peg is still oftentimes the best option because they're probably going to end up with that anyway. So now we're going to move further down the airway. So we're going to neonatal inspiratory noise. Further down, we're going to talk really about the subglottis. Uh, I'm sorry, the supraglottis. So almost always this is going to be laryngomalacia. I mean, you guys see this all the time in your office. So it's the most common cause of inspiratory stridor in the neonatal and early infant periods. Um, oftentimes this is termed tracheomalacia, but it's important to recognize these are totally different. This is inspiratory noise, which is how you really diagnose laryngomalacia in the clinic setting versus an expiratory noise, which is gonna be a tracheal problem. 
It's coarse, rough strider. Um, it's often confused with chest congestion, and it's and that's for good reason because it sounds just like it. It can be really, really hard sometimes to um, tell the difference unless you pay really close attention to the phase of breathing. The symptoms do wax and wane in most cases. It is worse when supine um, and worse with increased agitation. So if you think about it, increased agitation is going to have an increase in the velocity of the fluid, which means that something that you know, an, an obstructive lesion that was not causing turbulence and not causing strider, if you increase the flow, can cause turbulence and can cause strider. That's why the symptoms wax and wane. That's why laryngomalacia gets worse when kids are upset. So the infantile cartilage is soft and collapsible, um, and you have very short area epiglottic folds. So the epiglottis is kind of pulled tightly over the voice box, which makes it collapse more. Um, and you also get prolapse of the arytenoids. With laryngomalacia, you treat comorbid conditions. Primarily, that's going to be gastroesophageal reflux. It's, it's unclear to me exactly why reflux is associated with laryngomalacia. I think it can be explained mechanically. I don't know that um, it's just coincidence. Uh, lots of kids with laryngomalacia have ongoing uh, reflux as well. And one of the primary things that we do before we consider surgical treatment for these kids is we will sometimes treat them empirically with reflux medications and see if they get better. Um, I think that this is because when the kids are breathing, they're breathing against an obstruction, so it takes a little bit more negative intrathoracic pressure in order to get the air in. So they're a uh, higher negative intrathoracic pressure, right, to be able to get it in is also more likely to suck the acid up out of the stomach. And so that probably is where that's coming from. Um, it's never really been sort of proven to me one way or another. But regardless, they do <coughs> happen together. Surgery is reserved for uh, severe obstruction, apnea, feeding, weight gain issues. These kids can also look really miserable. They can have significant quality of life issues, which is hard to measure in an infant. Um, but if you pay attention to them, particularly the feeding, um, uh, superglottoplasty is an excellent option. This takes about 15 minutes. It's really, really easy. It makes a night and day difference uh, in the way that these kids feel. The most important thing with laryngomalacia is that 5% of children are going to have a second airway lesion. And so um, we are always thinking about what else could this kid have? So if it you know, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But if anything doesn't line up with that, then we have to start thinking, okay, does this kid have something else that's going on at the same time? Okay, so that's inspiratory strider. Now we're gonna to move to biphasic strider. So biphasic strider, like we talked about before, um, is gonna be with expiration and inspiration, and it's gonna be glottic or subglottic uh, in etiology it does tend to be more consistent. And the reason for that is that the glottic and subglottic airway are far less dynamic. Um, they're static, it's a, it's a cartilaginous ring, it's the vocal cords, uh, which are two sort of ligamentous structures that are sitting there. And so you tend to have it with every breath. Um, and they, these kids tend to have more significant signs and symptoms of obstruction, again, because it's fixed. So in the neonatal patient, um, this is primarily going to be bilateral vocal cord paresis. Very rarely a unilateral paresis can cause biphasic strider in a neonate. That's usually only in very small children, and they outgrow it really quickly. The problem with the vocal cords is that inconveniently they paralyze themselves in the midline instead of apart, and so the airway obstruction from this is profound. You can also have a glottic web. So just a, a problem of uh, in the embryologic development of the larynx, you have a small web. The vocal cords don't completely separate. This can be really mild and can just cause voice problems, or it can be incredibly severe. The web can actually be all the way down here. The worst one I've ever seen um, was like a pinhole, uh, like right in the back of the larynx. Um, so it can be really significant. You can be born with subglottic stenosis. So if you're born with subglottic stenosis, that's because the cricoid ring, um, instead of being a circle, is an ellipse. And so you can see here that this is a, an elliptical shaped uh, airway instead of being nice and round. Or you can have acquired subglottic stenosis. The neonatologists are doing such a good job of managing the kids that are on the vent for a prolonged period of time that we rarely see this anymore. This is generally caused from uh, prolonged intubation. You can actually see this is a perfect circle because the airway has scarred around the endotracheal tube that was there. So we still see it. Um, you know, why some kids get it when they're treated exactly the same as other kids is not entirely clear. Um, but this is far less common than it used to be.
So bilateral vocal cord uh, paresis, like I said, it's profound airway obstruction, so primarily is going to be treated with tracheostomy. I have occasionally seen kids who can be observed with this. <coughs> um, they are very noisy, um, but they feed well, they're growing well, they're doing fine otherwise, and so sometimes you can keep an eye on this. Um, they tend to be very, very noisy at night. Um, and I don't know why it's worse at night. I don't know if it's just the way that the voice <laughs> relaxes, um, but they can have profound sh uh, strider, particularly at night. You can do uh, bilateral vocal cord re for this. This is brand new. There's one guy here and one guy in France that's doing it. Um, it takes about eight or nine hours because it involves disconnecting and reconnecting like 15 different nerves, um, but the results have been good, so it'll be fun if that works. Um, for congenital subglottic stenosis, sometimes you can observe, um, you can actually split the cricoid ring and open it, and then you intubate the patient, that stents the airway open. Um, sometimes uh, if, the, um, if simple short-term stenting is not enough, you can actually uh, split the cricoid in the front and the back, pull it apart, and you put rib graft, and that's a laryngotracheal reconstruction. And that would be how you also treat the acquired form. Uh, the difference is with acquired is you have to wait for the inflammation from the, um, uh, from the intubation to resolve, and that can take years. I've seen it kids who have been intubated, and for whatever reason, they have what we call a reactive larynx, and there's this bulky masses of granulation tissue um, that, are, um, uh, that are all over the larynx. You really just have to wait for that to calm down before you start thinking about putting a rib graft in there. Other th otherwise, the rib graft just disappears. So expiratory strider, um, so we're now moving down below the subglottis. So this is primarily a tracheal or bronchial, bronchial source of obstruction. It does tend to be worse with cough. It's a rough and coarse quality. In the neonatal patient, uh, there are three main things that we're going to think about. The first is tracheomalacia. This can be tracheomalacia that you're born with, and so it's just congenital. It can be from compression from an outside source, or it can be acquired in situations like tracheoesophageal fistula. That's a really common setting for tracheomalacia. <laughs> Complete tracheal rings uh, is also common. That's a severe uh, form of airway obstruction. And then tracheal stenosis, which generally is acquired from some kind of airway instrumentation. So you can see normal trachea here, got these nice cartilaginous rings, membranous uh, portion of the trachea here. And then here, you've got this fish mouth sort of trachea malacia. Okay, so. Um, now we're going to move to the infant stage, okay? So we're going to do the exact same thing we just did, but we're going to do it with infants. So inspiratory, biphasic, and expiratory, but really thinking about the differential in this specific age group. So most commonly, this is going to be um, resolving laryngomalacia, okay? So inspiratory strider in an infant, so think like a three, four, five-month-old, um, is going to be resolving laryngomalacia. The mild laryngomalacia is not noted until the infant stage, um, oftentimes because it was so mild that they weren't strong enough to actually cause the collapse. And so as they get stronger, um, there's new developmental stages. They start laughing, they're crying harder, they're playing, they're crawling, they're doing all these things, and that's when they start noticing the sound. That's really common, okay? So any increase in airflow velocity can sort of create the symptoms where there wasn't anything before, and that's just simply because the kids are stronger and bigger. A molecular cyst um, typically is not noticed in the neonatal stage. It causes retroflexion of the epiglottis and can simulate laryngomalacia. So this is one of the main reasons why if a kid has classic laryngomalacia, I always scope them in the office because once or twice a year I'll find a molecular cyst and that does need to go away. So when I see that, that's always going to be surgery. You can also see decreased muscular tone. Um, most of the time this is from uh, just pharyngeal collapse and oftentimes from palatal flutter. You'll put the scope in the kid and as they're breathing, the palate is just flopping all over the place and it looks like somebody who's snoring. Um, this is really common in kids with severe neuromuscular disorders. Um, I've seen this in kids with like HSV encephalitis, hypoxic uh, encephalopathy, all of those things. Um, can cause this kind of decreased muscular tone and cause this inspiratory type noise. <coughs> so as we move down the airway now, we're going to talk about biphasic strider in the infant. Um, you can also get laryngospasm. This is really, really common, and I see this a lot. This is most commonly associated with uh, gastroesophageal reflux. It's really severe, acute onset of airway obstruction with loud biphasic strider. It totally freaks the parents out. It's super, super scary. They end up in the pediatrician's office 
over and over and over and over and over um, because it's so terrifying um, and because um, it tends to happen repeatedly. There, the classic thing is that there are no associated signs of an upper respiratory tract infection and the symptoms resolve generally within minutes, so usually within an hour. Um, so if by the time they get to the ER, the strider has gone away, that's not going to be croup, it's probably going to be laryngospasm. So croup, the problem is croup sounds a lot like laryngospasm as far as the symptoms, so you really have to tease out the whole clinical picture. This can be associated with URI symptoms. The symptoms <laughs> usually last for hours to days as opposed to minutes, and it's very rare in children who are less than one year of age. So if there is true recurrent croup in a child who's less than one, that's concerning for a structural abnormality. Um, and so that is a risk factor that almost always is going to need further evaluation. Um, but this, again, this I see all the time. Kids come in with a diagnosis of recurrent croup, um, and it can be really hard because they're going to urgent care, they're getting treated with steroids, they're getting racemic epi. It's like, well, are they getting better because of the racemic epi, or are they getting better because the reflux episode is better. Um, and then probably the rarest, but the thing that I worry about the most at this age is subglottic hemangioma. So uh, hemangiomas are going to grow um, around this age. And so these kids will be often diagnosed with something else like laryngomalacia, but the difference is, is the symptoms get worse instead of getting better. Um, and so uh, this is treated with propranolol, and surgery is uh, reserved for refractory cases. There's a lot of different things we can do if uh, propranolol doesn't work. We can inject steroids. We can resect it endoscopically. You can resect it open. Uh, you also can do um, trach. It's really bad. So biphasic strider in an infant um, that's caused by stridocytosis <laughs> is it's going to be the mild case because the really bad ones are going to be noted in the neonatal uh, age. Oftentimes, this can be diagnosed as laryngomalacia, but again, the problem will tend to get worse instead of better. Um, and so, you, with increased activity levels, you see increase in strider. That's why as these kids get bigger and stronger, you notice it more. So, expiratory strider in the infant is going to be primarily um, either mild congenital tracheomalacia or tracheal compression. The classic uh, presentation um, outside of the neonatal uh, period about a, is about a 12-month-old who comes in with expiratory strider, and they sound like, they call it washing machine breathing. They sound like little washing machines as they go, like, walking by you. Um, and that is really, really concerning for tracheal compression. Generally, it's going to be a vascular ring or a pulmonary sling. It also can be a chest or mediastinal mass, like a neuroblastoma or a lymphoma. Um, and so I've seen all of those. Um, and again, you don't see it. You know, a lot of times the parents are like, why didn't we know this earlier? And it's just the kids just aren't strong enough to generate enough airway noise early on um, to be able to see this until they're about a year of age. And then congenital tracheomalacia, this is generally going to be mild. If it's really bad, you're going to see it in the neonatal period. So the last that we're going to talk about is pediatric and adolescent airway. So this is about, this is going to be everyone from like 2 to 18. Okay, so um, there, even though there's such a huge difference between a two-year-old and an 18-year-old, actually the kinds of airway problems that they get are, are not all that different. So inspiratory strider is really unusual in older children. It's typically going to be associated with low airway tone as a result of severe brain injury or an underlying neuromuscular disorder. That's what I talked about before. These are kids who are 8, 9, 10, 12 who have cerebral palsy or things like that. Um, and they can have really profound <laughs> And there are different things that you can do with it. Surgery is generally not helpful. You know, people talk about removing the tonsils and the adenoid, and sometimes that's indicated, but almost always these kids still have problems. Um, inspiratory strider is uh, much more likely to be acquired from something else that's going on in their life. Um, and then we have to consider that these could be later presentations of all the other things that we've talked about. Very rarely I'll see a kid who had noisy breathing, consistent with laryngomalacia, early on in life, who will present actually with sleep apnea. Um, and it's because they don't have big tonsils, they don't have big adenoids, they actually have residual infantile appearing larynx that's causing them to have sleep apnea. That's unusual, but it definitely happens. So biphasic strider in uh, children and adolescents can be a late presentation of mild or moderate subglottic stenosis, um, particularly if there's a history of prematurity or intubation. But I would say most commonly I see paradoxical vocal cord dysfunction. So uh, the presentation for this is uh, acute onset of severe strider and distress. 
Um, typically this resolves within minutes to hours and there's almost always some kind of inciting event that happens, exposure to cold air, exercise, extreme stress, things like that. It typically occurs in teenagers. They're often high functioning and successful. So whenever I see a kid who has this, I always ask them if they make straight A's and I've never had one tell me that they don't make straight A's. They always make straight A's. And so you really have to think about stress. These are great kids. I mean, they're really, really high functioning. They're just stressed. So this can also occur in the very young. This is something that you never hear about, I was never taught about, I never read about. And I started seeing these kids when I became an attending that are like two, three, four, five, eight, that are having all of the classic symptoms of paradoxical vocal cord dysfunction. Um, and so what is happening to these kids is you have to look for modifying factors. So there are all of these layers of things that sensitize the vocal cords, um, which are, are, uh, they're, they're very twitchy, okay? The vocal cords are really sensitive to lots of different things. They're very finicky, they're very twitchy. And so what you need to do is you need to look at, do they have reflux? Do they have a history of reflux as an infant? Do they have allergies? All of these things can sensitize the vocal cords and then you add stressful psychosocial factors and then you add something else on top of it like running in cold air and then all of a sudden their vocal cords decide that they're just gonna slam shut and they can't breathe and so it's really scary. Speech therapy is remarkably successful for this. They can actually do this respiratory retraining thing, which is great, um, and the primary way that we treat this. Classic example, I saw a 14-year-old just, uh, I think, two days ago, has a history of very mild paradoxical vocal cord dysfunction. She gets a little bit of shortness of breath when she lost track. Um, I asked her if she made straight A's. She said yes, um, and um, she got sick over Christmas and every time she would start laughing, she would basically get strangled and have these like coughing fits that were really, really miserable and were kind of alarming to the family and to her. And so what happened is you had a kid who had some underlying stress and then you add on top of it what is what we call a post-viral vagal neuropathy. So the URI basically causes the nerves to be mildly neuropathic. And so um, then you add on top of that uh, the increased airflow from laughing, and so the vocal cords just shut. Um, and so you kind of have to think about this in layers. Expiratory strider <laughs> in older children and in adolescents is rare, it's worrisome, and you have to think about compressive lesions. So this would really bother me if I saw this. Um, so that's a ton of information, right? So I don't want you to remember any of it because it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, and so what I want to do is to think about this from the perspective of listening to the patient and how they breathe and then understanding the mechanics and that's going to allow us uh, to do what we need to do. So the first thing we do is listen and then based off of just simple listening you create your differential based off of upper airway, glottis or subglottis, lower airway. Um, then you risk stratify and then you can almost always make your diagnosis, at least generally you can kind of narrow it into something. So this is everything that we've talked about. So this is here if you guys want it, you know, you can just have it and then that way you don't have to memorize anything. Um, so first case, um, so I had a two-year-old who presented to my clinic, um, this was a couple years ago, um, and he had starter. Um, boogery, inspiratory noise, constant congestion, and mouth breathing. Um, so looked like a kid who had significant, you know, adenoid hypertrophy. He's a two-year-old, he's got all the symptoms. And so that was what was thought was going on. The weird thing was is I just sort of happened to notice this as the kid was walking around the room. He made some coughing sound. Um, and I asked my mom, I was like, what was that? And she was like, yeah, what was that? And she was like, I've been noticing that his whole life. And I was like, okay, well, let's talk about it. So we started talking about it. Does he have it with exercise? You know, do, is he limited in exercise? All these different things. And she's like, yeah, he's always had it. It's never getting better. If anything, it's getting a little bit worse. Um, and I was like, okay, well, that, that is concerning. But it was really hard to distinguish it because he had all this other airway noise um, from um, his congestion. So um, in a child and adolescent, we're down here, inspiratory noise. So we're thinking nasal obstruction, adenoid hypertrophy, or low tone. Um, and then we're thinking expiratory strider, so compressive tracheal lesion or some kind of acquired cause, okay? So what next? So um, inspiratory noise, most consistent with stertor. I scope him in the office and he's got a big adenoid. Everything else looks great, okay? So that really helps to make the diagnosis at least a part of what's happening. 
The important thing is that we cannot see below the vocal cords on an in-office exam. That requires anesthesia. Sometimes in adults you can do it, um, but even then most people won't tolerate it. To really get a good tracheal exam uh, requires anesthesia. So um, what are we going to do about the expiratory noise? It is Strider, um, but it's gone unrecognized because he's so noisy otherwise. So we did the scope. We know that he has adenoid hypertrophy. And he still has this expiratory strider that we don't know what to do with, but we're, you know, it's concerning because of his age. So we're going to risk stratify. He has no other medical diagnoses. Uh, he has no associated syndrome and no history of surgery or airway instrumentation. So acquired causes, I pretty much can get rid of that um, because he doesn't have a reason to have it. And so it's probably tracheomalacia, which has just been unrecognized and has gotten worse as he got stronger, or a compressive tracheal lesion. So we know he needs an adenectomy, so I'm going to have him in the OR anyway. So before um, we intubate him, I'm just going to take a look at the airway um, before doing the adenoidectomy. So when I did that, um, this is what I saw. So this is the trachea here. Um, this is the left main stem bronchus. So you should see the carina, okay, but you just don't. Um, and you should see the right main stem bronchus, which is right over here. So this is a bad tracheal compression, um, potentially from an outside source, especially because of its asymmetry. So the next step is a CT angiogram of the chest to try to see what's happening, and he ended up with a double aortic arch. And so that's where that came from. Um, it was totally asymptomatic otherwise. No, absolutely nothing else except a little bit of noisy breathing. Okay, the next case. Um, so three-month-old presents with recurrent croup, multiple trips to the pediatrician, multiple trips to the ER, multiple trips to urgent care. Um, and he has the onset of severe strider, totally freaks the parents out, stops breathing, looks like he turns blue. Um, I mean, I've never met a parent who didn't tell me that their kid turned blue. I really find that to be a really hard thing. They're like, oh, yeah, they... You know, their lips were purple or something. And that's obviously not true cyanosis. Um, so sometimes it's a little hard to tell. I do an imitation of biphasic strider, and they're like, yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, this usually occurs at night. Um, like I said, they've been to the ER multiple times. It gets steroids. It gets better immediately is what they tell me. And so they're convinced that that's what's making him better. Um, no call for cold, no feeder, fever. Strider resolves within minutes. Um, child does spit up a lot and does not like to lay flat. So, and it is best with biphasic strider. These are the things that we're thinking about. So, again, I have the benefit. I get to cheat, right? I get to look with the scope. So that gives me a ton of information. So normal glottis, normal vocal cord motion, no laryngomalacia. So um, these things I can get rid of. Uh, we know that he, his vocal cords work. We know that he doesn't have a glottic web. And then we're going to risk stratify. No other medical problems, no history of prematurity, intubation, or surgery, and no noisy breathing between episodes. Um, and so, again, we talked about with biphasic strider that those are glottic and subglottic causes typically. And since those are relatively static structures, if the kids have a problem there, it generally tends to be there all the time on some level. Now, it will get better and worse but it generally does not go from a totally asymptomatic kid to a kid who looks like they're dying. That would be very, very unusual. So it's unlikely to be a structural component to the problem. Um, and again, you do that by asking about exercise intolerance. You know, do they have noisy breathing when they exercise, when they're laughing, playing, crying? And they're like, no, no, everything's great. It's just these events is when they have it. So we know it's not that. Not We're not thinking subglottic stenosis. I mean, it's in the back of our mind, right? But probably not. Um, and then uh, we don't think it's a subglottic hemangioma because, again, the symptoms should be there on some level all the time. Um, and he doesn't have upper respiratory infection symptoms. So it's really not <coughs> true. So it's most likely to be a laryngospasm. So. Um, generally, uh, you know, the kid spits up a lot, doesn't like to lay flat, so um, I treat uh, these kids with reflux medications and then careful counseling on, on concerning signs and symptoms. If at any point something doesn't make sense, kids have to go to the operating room for a look. Um, and so I have a very low threshold for doing that, but um, usually once the parents understand what the problem is, they understand the pathophysiology, they understand how we're treating it, and you give them just a little bit of a period of observation, most of the time they'll see enough improvement to, you know, to start believing that, that it really is, is what you think it is. So that's it. So I'm going to ask two questions at the end. So what percentage of children with laryngomalacia have a second airway lesion? 
five. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that this is probably kids are diagnosed with laryngomalacia because they have airway noise, and they probably really don't have symptomatic laryngomalacia. They probably, it's probably the second thing that's causing it. But the point is, is that when someone comes in with a diagnosis of laryngomalacia, you always have to be thinking about something else. And then a patient with expiratory strider can be easily evaluated and diagnosed in the ambulatory setting. Is that true or false? Yeah, so that, that requires um, a look in the operating room by either me or one of the pediatric pulmonologists. I actually like it when the pulmonologists do this. Um, I do rigid bronchoscopy. Most pediatric ENTs do rigid exams, which is great because you can actually surgically intervene on things. Um, but when you're looking at particularly an expiratory component like tracheomalacia and things like that, the kids have to be under a, a little bit deeper level of anesthesia for um, me to do a rigid exam than they are for a flexible exam um, because I'm going all the way through the vocal cords with a rigid metal bronchoscope, whereas the flexible scope uh, usually just goes through an LMA, and so you get a lot more of a dynamic view. Um, so if I'm worried about tracheomalacia, um, a lot of times um, they're already seeing pulmonology anyway, and so we'll have them do the bronch because it's a, it's a much better view. Questions? We did have one question online. They want to know what would be the etiology for rhinitis in infancy? That's a really good question. I don't think anybody really knows. There is a theory that it has to do with hormonal changes, um, that as the child is basically like withdrawing, in a sense, from the mom's um, hormones, um, that they uh, get this really profound rhinitis. Um, and I think that's actually common in pregnancy. Women get like congestion and rhinitis. I know my uh, my wife did. So, yeah. <laughs> Any questions in the room, Dr. Mueller? Thanks, Dr. Reeves. I appreciate that. This is a very nice framework for the Thank you. Um, for all. Uh, Pediatricians and, and uh, my med students learning this now, it's a nice framework of a approach. And uh, I had a question, a couple things. For children who have tongue base obstruction, um, if they also have a short frenulum, mm -hmm. do you advocate for frenulectomy or holding <laughs> off on that? Oh, man, that's my, <laughs> my least favorite question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I basically do what Kristen and Amy tell me to do. Um, so the... So, yes, um, I don't think that the frenulum plays a huge role in the airway. Um, there are, um, and there are two reasons for that. So one is, in my mind, if a kid has a tight frenulum, it's going to help hold the tongue forward. That's the way that I would think about it. Um, but there's all this, like, crazy, okay, dental literature that talks about how a tight frenulum causes obstructive sleep apnea, which makes no sense to me. Like, I mean, it's totally nuts. Um, but my point is, is that I think it probably doesn't make a big difference either way. So you have this kind of one group of people who think it causes the one problem, and then one group of people who think it, you know, like myself, thinks that maybe it's actually helping. I would say um, if the kid has incredibly mild micronathia, um, and doesn't need surgery for any other reason, um, then I mean, one reason to consider surgery would be poor feeding, right? And so if the kid is having poor feeding, you could certainly, and it was a horrible frenulum, you could certainly try the frenulectomy. It's probably not going to make, they're already having trouble, right? So if you do the frenulectomy, see if they get better. If the feeding doesn't get better with that, then you know that it's an airway problem and a base of tongue problem, so then you go ahead and do the distraction. Um, but I, I don't think it's a major player um, in, um, in these patients. So it may, it may be a, a small factor, but I don't think it's a big one. The other question, next question is about children who have had CPAP either as preemies or in the nursery. We see a lot of uh, sometimes some effect on their uh, nostrils, but also um, they tend to be snotty, snorty kids. Um, ha have you noticed that, and, and is there any specific approaches you do for that? Because we have a lot of parents yeah. come to me with their snotty all the time or clogged all the time yeah. having had CPAP. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and you see, that, you see that in adults. Um, so for some reason, um, 
there's, it's not a really well described phenomenon, but you see kids who have, or you see adults who've been on CPAP for a long time, a lot of them tend to get this kind of turbinate hypertrophy that happens. And so a lot of them will end up needing a turbinate reduction at some point. Um, and so I think that they're, I think you're probably having the same thing that's, you know, the same thing that's causing that in the adult is probably causing these same symptoms in kids, whether or not they have turbinate hypertrophy or not. I think about the it's sort of exact opposite of the problem. You think about kids who have um, tracheostomy or patients who have laryngectomy. They have, they have huge changes in their nasal function. And so there is something that is the, the airflow through the nose is intimately tied to the health of the nose itself, and it's not well described, other than to say that I've noticed exactly what you've noticed and, and others have as well. And so you kind of have to treat the symptoms. There isn't really anything else to do about it, but there is absolutely this phenomenon of how nasal airflow changes the function of the nasal mucosa, and it changes it for the worse, for sure. Um, but it's a, it's a hard problem, and it's, it's difficult to treat. But if you, have a, if you have a kid who's really symptomatic, especially to the point where they're not tolerating their CPAP or their BiPAP or they're needing more pressures, um, it's definitely worth looking at the turbinates because if they're hypertrophy, number one, turbinate reduction helps hypertrophy, but um, tur uh, turbinate reduction also helps chronic rhinitis. And so if you have chronic rhinitis that's been refractory to all other medical therapy, um, Turbinate reduction actually makes the sinonasal symptoms better, um, their quality of life better for whatever reason. Any more questions? Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Sorry, I was a little late coming yeah, in. No problem. Um, two kind of two questions for you. So the, the first one you might have covered, and I just missed it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about office triage to ENT? So you know, um, I've definitely had loud babies in my office, and so if the baby is loud but the baby is thriving, does that baby need to get worked up? And then uh, loud preteens. So I I've got you know obese special needs kids, right. and I walk in the room and you hear. Oh, I'm like, right. okay, that's that's not normal, right. but it's a special right. needs kid, and is there, I don't know, are they having apnea or something, and then bad sleep quality contributing to their behavioral issues, so they should yeah. also get an airway workup. So I want to hear about that. Yeah. So for the for the younger kids who um, have airway noise, probably worth an evaluation. The As far as the, like, in-office triage, it really depends on how exactly what you said. It depends on how the kid is doing. The kid is having scary respiratory events. If there's any cyanosis, um, if the parents are totally freaked out, you know, pick up the phone and call. We can get them in in the next, you know, see them that day or the next day or whatever. Um, but if the kid's thriving, and then this is really my big one, if the symptoms are intermittent, uh, they tend to wax and wane, and if the child is feeding well, um, taking a bottle well, then that automatically reduces my level of concern probably still needs to be looked at, um, but could be done probably in the next few weeks. Um, typically, kids who have um, really significant airway obstruction, they're not going to be thriving, and they're not going to be feeding well. And so if it's taking them an hour to take a bottle, that's, that's a problem. Um, and so that's one of my kind of criteria that I use is how long does it take you to take a bottle? And, you know, if it's an hour for two ounces, that's worrisome, um, whereas if they chug six ounces or eight ounces really quickly, that makes me feel a lot better. For the older kid, um, you're right, it's a, it's a different situation. Um, and so those kids, I tend to move more in the direction of exactly what you mentioned, sleep apnea. And so as long as they're not having major airway events during the day, um, or at least things that are unexplained. So if it's a kid with cerebral palsy or really severe developmental delay and they have these mild obstructive events related to low muscular tone, um, that's, that's pretty common for those and there's generally not a ton to do about it. Um, you can use a nasal trumpet in them. Most patients don't tolerate that. Um, and then if it's really, really bad, I mean, really your next step, you're looking at tracheostomy, which, you know, nobody wants to do. Um, but for the, the big kid, developmental delay, it just kind of has that um, congested, stertorous, noisy, sort of heavy breathing that you associate with people who are obese. Uh, 
Um, I generally work that up in the direction of sleep apnea to kind of tell me how, how bad is this and how much does this need to be worked up. As long as the events aren't happening during the day, though, I'm not as worried. Anything else? The um, person that asked about rhinitis, they want to know about um, treatment for rhinitis in infancy. Um, so I will usually use a topical steroid of some kind. Um, it's off-label use, um, and so I try to use it sparingly. I use it all the time, though, even in infants and neonates. Um, so kids who have uh, piriform aperture stenosis, um, or kids with rhinitis of infancy, I usually use ophthalmic decadron, uh, ophthalmic dexamethasone, and I'll put one to two drops in each nostril, and that helps a lot. It helps a lot. I try to, I, you know, have them do it for a couple weeks and then have them come off of it, and then if it's a kid with piriform aperture stenosis, for instance, uh, that if they come off of it and then they get worse again immediately, then a lot of times I'll um, uh, go ahead and plan to do surgery for that kid. For rhinitis of infancy, the good thing is is that it's self-limited, um, and so it will get better. So usually you just need a couple weeks of therapy, and um, within a couple of weeks, things will start to get better. So, but yeah, ophthalmic dexamethasone is the, the one. Anything else? All right. Thank you.